Cass Clayton. And I'm Taylor Scott. And we're both professional musicians, and we're here at Dazzle to share with you a couple cool things that Dazzle's doing in the music community right now. One, some of you know about, they've started the Musician's Food Pantry and turned the entire back room of the venue into a food pantry so musicians can stop by on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, noon to six, and stock their own pantry for free and do a little grocery shopping, spend your money elsewhere, because we know it's been a, a pretty challenging time for musicians without gigs. Another thing Dazzle's been doing throughout uh, the shutdowns and all these different difficulties is providing working musicians with paid gigs uh, during the week and even when it's been really, really difficult uh, for them to remain open. And the next phase of that is going to be a weekly jam that we're starting here at Dazzle as part of the Bread and Jam program. So we're going to be announcing, uh, it's going to start in April, we're going to be announcing all the details on that on the Dazzle socials very soon. So tune back in. Come on, people, help Dazzle, let a helping hand draw the musicians. Give us a hand so they can get bread and jam. Starting in just a few minutes, everyone. We're trying to get everybody in. We're starting in just a few minutes. We could give a quick hello, uh, hello to the room. I, should I? What's that? Should I just give a quick hello to the room and tell them we're about to start? That's what I said. We're gonna wait. Oh, did you go ahead? Yeah, I did. So um, we're just getting ready to start, everyone. So we're gonna have your attention. And we have a live stream, so we're we'll go straight for an hour and then 
We'll be ready to party with y'all. All right. Thank you so much. We're just waiting for our cue. And um, while we're waiting for that cue, though, I think everybody should stand. We want to give uh, someone who I think is very important. If without him, we'd not be here tonight. Mr. Julian Rubenstein. Let's give him a standing ovation. <laughs> Well, the truth is I couldn't do it with all of you, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> so thank you all for being here, it's so great. Because you know what happened was we tried to have this at Tattered Cover and they said we couldn't have anyone, so the three of us were even gonna, supposed to be in our houses and anyway, Donnie got creative and here we are so we could be in person and it's so, it's so great. Anyway, as you know, it's been a long road and thanks for coming. Thank you sir, so much, uh, are we ready? All right, it gives me a thumbs up. So tonight, tonight, May 11, 2021, is the official book launch of this book. This book right here, I hold in my hand. <laughs> the Hollow, Five Bullets, One Gun, The Struggle to Save an American Neighborhood by Julian Rubenstein. This is why we're here. So thank you all for being here in person, and we welcome everybody who's streaming as well on Facebook and on YouTube. Now, many people who are in the book are here tonight, as well as many of the city's powerful activists who've been fighting for justice on the streets. Tonight is presented by the Tattered Cover Bookstore. The Tattered Cover Bookstore is a local independent bookstore with four locations in the Denver metropolitan area, soon to be five. They plan to open their children's location at Standing Marketplace, which is in Aurora, later this summer. It is also their 50th anniversary in 2021. They want you to know they couldn't have made it this far without your support from the Colorado community. So thank all of you for shopping locally. And speaking of shopping, lo shopping locally, a big thanks to Dazzle for hosting this event tonight. <clears throat> to my left, Julian Rubenstein is a journalist and author of The Ballad of the Whiskey Robber which was a New York Times editor choice and a finalist for the Edgar Awards for Best Fact Crime. His work has appeared in The New Yorker, Rolling Stone, and a New York Times Magazine, as well as Best American Crime Writing. He now lives in Denver. Julian has spent the last seven years digging deep into a story that we all think we might know, but do we really? If you read the book, you'll find out you may not know what you thought you knew. This new book called The Holly, Five Bullets, One Gun, and the Struggle to Save an American Neighborhood. Uh, tonight we're in conversation with Julian, and also the centerpiece of the book, Mr. Terrence Roberts. Terrence Roberts is an activist, former gang member, and former executive director of the Prodigal Son Initiative. Julian describes his book as a multi-generational crime story, featuring a cast of interconnected characters from gang members to elected officials, to cops, billionaire developers, activists, and nonprofit executives. It's a story of development and justification that spans more than 50 years to the present day of 2021. Once again, we wanna welcome everybody who's streaming. My name is Donnie Betts. I'm a producer, director, actor, and podcaster. Tonight, I'm honored to be the moderator of this conversation of this amazing story of the Holly. There's a few people we want to acknowledge tonight. Now, there's a whole list that I could acknowledge but I'm just gonna do a few, so please don't get upset if I don't recognize you, okay? So James Mejia, Executive Director of the Denver Film Society, hope he's here. Jenny Eldridge and Scott. Yeah, give him a big round of applause, please. <laughs> Alton Dillia with his brand new hair. So I'm gonna destroy the last name, so I'm just gonna say Trig and Vicky. So, cause I don't, <laughs> So I've learned to be smart over the years and not mess up people's names, okay? Because they come back to get you, okay? So, you guys ready? Ready to go. Right. Okay. So as I said earlier, Jewel, you've been digging into this story for the past seven years of your life. Why? <laughs> for this moment. <laughs> um, well, um, you know, in 2013, I uh, read in the New York Times, <clears throat> a story that was also, of course, being covered here in Denver, 
uh, I was at the time living in, in Brooklyn, and uh, I read about this former gang leader who had become an anti-gang activist and who at his own peace rally had shot someone and the neighborhood, the city was really up in arms and trying to figure out what exactly had happened. It had also happened at a time when this particular place when it, where it happened had been undergoing a big transition, um, a redevelopment. Um, it was a historic neighborhood and a historic place. Um, and I just really wanted to find out more. Um, and I first flew back thinking I could, um, you know, manage to do this story coming in and out, staying with my mom. Um, but really, uh, the story became incredibly engrossing uh, and way more complicated uh, than I could handle really uh, doing something like that. So I did end up moving back here in order to uh, to do this story. And so I, I now, as, as all of you know, I live in Denver. Um, but really, I would just add that um, the first person that got me particularly hooked on the story was the person to my left, Terrence Roberts, whose life story is just remarkable um, and who had a very different idea of what had happened on the day of this peace rally. I mean, at this shooting, uh, and that was, he believed that various forces wanted him out of his position there. And I really didn't know what to believe or what to think, but um, I could definitely tell that this story went really deep and had the possibility of telling a much bigger story. And that's what I was interested in doing, and that's what I set out to do. So a lot of time I like to start at the beginning, beginning at least for me, and that we want to talk about somebody that's very important in Terrence's life. And we're going to talk about a lot of those people tonight, but one person in particular I want to talk about is Terrence's grandmother uh, and how she got to Colorado in the first place. If not that, then Terrence would even be here. So either one of you can take that question, but why don't you start, Julia? Well, I would only say that the book starts uh, with Ernestine, Terrence's grandmother, and the reason this book starts um, all the way back then, I mean, there are a few reasons, but when I first tried to approach this story, I thought it was kind of a, you know, a mystery story, a, a twist of a mystery story, not exactly a who done it, but a why done it. Um, we knew who pulled the trigger, the person admitted, Terrence admitted pulling the trigger, but why? Why did he shoot this guy at his own peace rally? And I started to feel this huge sense, beginning from Terrence and then from more and more people I met in the neighborhood, that there was this real you know, sense of history just coursing through this story uh, and that the only way I could really fully try to understand what happened was to really understand the history of it. And Ernestine was the first person that I, that you know, after an opening scene in the book, uh, the book starts in 1955 when Terrence's grandmother um, who he can tell you a little more about, and who I luckily got to know. She passed away a couple of years ago. But she had left and come to Denver in 1955 after living, uh, she was living in, in virtual servitude on, on a cotton plantation with 11 siblings and her parents in a one-room cabin um, where she was making a dollar a day, and then she had been promoted to a cook in the kitchen where she was making $3 a day, uh, but the plantation owner had come on to her and she didn't feel safe and she ended up escaping and coming to a place she'd never been but where she had an aunt and it was Denver and she came in 1955 and uh, Terrence is a third generation resident uh, not just of Denver but of the, this uh, neighborhood that the book is about uh, but maybe Terrence you can talk about Ernestine for a minute as well. So I do want to say that she actually told Julian more about her life. <laughs> it's like, we, you know, we get this journalist to you, Granny, you open up everything. We didn't know this stuff about you, but, um, you know, uh, we call her Granny Understine. Everyone called her Granny Understine. She was like, everyone's a granny. And she had this restaurant on 28th and Fairfax, which is literally like in the middle of Park Hill. So growing up there, it was just like I knew everybody. I mean, the, you know, mayors would come through there, elected officials. Uh, Wellington Webb, uh, Broncos, Denver Nuggets, whoever would come. And you just never know who may walk through the door because she had the premier soul food spot for the whole community at the time. So she was the hardest person work, work, the hardest working person that I ever met literally in my life. She would like get up early and be gone. She wouldn't get home until 11 or 12 p.m., which was not good for me as a young man who was in the gang at that time because I had too much 
use of her house in my free time, but it also taught me a good work ethic once I left the gangs to really work hard and get what I want. And, and so Granny Ernestine taught the whole community that. I think her personality and her work ethic and just how she just didn't take a bunch of bull crap. Like she didn't like to play a lot of games. She was the most loving person you would ever meet, but in five minutes she'd be like, put your pants up, you know what I mean? <laughs> that kind of person. Um, she taught Park Hill how to be how we became. Mm. One thing I would just add to that is, uh, so Ernestine first lived uh, in or around Five Points, which was the original black neighborhood in Denver, um, a really historic place known as the Harlem of the West for some time. But it was becoming overcrowded and African Americans needed more places to live in Denver. And there was one neighborhood that in 1947, Quig, then Mayor Quig Newton uh, pointed out for, for a, a process of uh, purposeful integration, he called it, and it was the neighborhood of Northeast Park Hill. Um, <clears throat> which is where the holly is. Uh, Quig Newton, by the way, succeeded uh, Mayor Stapleton, who is the longest ever tenured mayor of Denver, and he was also a KKK member. As most of you know, uh, the, the neighborhood of Stapleton has since in the last year been renamed Central Park, as a lot of this stuff has you know, come out more in the last year. But uh, so Ernestine um, was one of the first blacks to be allowed to live in Northeast Park Hill in 1960. Um, I think at the age of 27, I believe, I'd have to check this in the book, but <clears throat> she uh, moved in, she got, the, the, these are nice little brick houses. Um, at the time in 1960, uh, Northeast Park Hill was 90 something percent white. By the end, by end of 1960, by the uh, 60s, in 1970, it was 90-something percent black. It was really one of the largest uh, or most, you know, obvious cases of white flight on record. Uh, it had become a, just a classic real estate brokers were in there warning whites of, of, of the re dropping real estate values. And sure enough, over the course of this, you know, very tumultuous, ultimately, 1960s, which I think we may get, get to, that uh, that era, Northeast Park Hill, uh, became a different place and also ended up becoming, specifically in the Holly, the pivotal place where Denver's civil rights movement um, happened. And I'll, I'll just call out to Alvin Jones in the back there, whose brother Nathan Jones was shot in Holly Square by the police in 1968, Nathan Alvin was there. And uh, that was the moment uh, that really kicked off the, the protest movement in 1968 at a tense time in Denver. So let's just uh, keep going from there. Like 1968, which a lot of people said a pivotal point in, at least in Denver and Park Hill for the civil rights, so-called civil rights movement. I always think that's such a narrow term, the use of the word civil. So I said more like human rights movement that happened. It also was a, a, a growth of the Black Power movement too here in the Denver area, uh, headed by Lauren Watson. Um, and I call out uh, Alison Dillier, um, who's, yes, right here. Um, but I want you to talk about- Lauren's why, nephew is here. Why was it so important to bring that out? I mean, you talk about the history of the neighborhood and Ernestine Boyd and bringing in that historical part of it. Why was it so important to bring that out, starting with 1968 and the death of how do you think that was important? Uh, I, well, what was so interesting to me was how it, it sort of pivotal and just uh, conflict-oriented and tragic uh, the place was, being, being Holly Square in Northeast Park Hill. This is a place that was also the hub of the neighborhood. It was a place of a, of a shopping center where people went to meet, um, talk about things, talk about politics, talk about you know, anything, and at night, the youth gathered there. And in 68, in particular, which, in even 66, 67, as I chronicle in the book, there was were some tensions. Obviously, tensions were growing around the country. Um, Denver had kind of relatively kept it mostly calm. But on this particular night in 68, a lot of people were there, Alvin in the back, you know, lived it firsthand, what I'm saying right now, um, that night. And uh, sure enough, um, the police, with no provocation that we know of, 
pulled up in an unmarked car and shot Alvin. Um, and um, the reason I think that's so significant is because activism is really a part actually of, of not only this neighborhood, but really the African American community in Denver. But I would say that this book chronicles not just activism in Denver, but of the thwarted activism in Denver, and that goes all the way up to today. And we'll get to some of that now, and as, as, as I think you mentioned, but and we have some of the city's most important activists here in the room tonight. Thank you all for coming. And these are people who have really gone through hell in order to just fight for justice under their own constitutional rights of peace, peaceful protest and they face charges because of it. I mean, one of them is sitting next to me, there's others here in the room. So I thought that it was a really important touchstone in the story. It also happened literally feet away from where Terrence ended up shooting Hassan Jones years later. So let's switch to Terrence for a moment. Terrence, can you share with us what it was like growing up in that neighborhood? You mentioned the fact you had a lot of time on your hand, for one thing. So. Um, Let's talk about growing up in that neighborhood and why is so important then and still so important to you now. You know, Park Hill is, it's kind of like the, it's like if you watch a movie about an African American community like in Harlem or Chicago where you see a bunch of African Americans, African American store owners, African American homeowners, African American mailman, the gangster and the pastor are all in the whole place, right? Like, and that's how it was growing up in the Dahlia in the Holly. It was walkable. People were out, we were break dancing, people were playing music, people have bicycles with big speakers on the back. You know, it was just a great, like, African American experience. And we had white neighbors and other people too. Like, it wasn't like, I was a kid, so I didn't understand racism and, and systemic racism, and all these different things. Um, it was just a great experience growing up in the Holly. It was just always something to do every day. People were out, everyone knew each other, you know, so. It's a neighborhood. It was a great neighborhood. Yeah, fantastic. Um, thank you for the answer. Um, let's talk about now, Terrence, too. Um, after you, you're growing up and you become a gang member, um, one is, you said, to protect the neighborhood. But after that, you know, you spent some time uh, in prison. So one of those times in prison, you had a, an epiphany and that something that changed your life to what the person you are today. Can you share that experience with us? <clears throat> So yeah, so when I did become a blood, it, it did feel like we were protecting the community because when we're talking about in the mid to late 80s, early 90s, uh, you know, tribalism, especially when you're dealing with impoverished communities, communities, it's not just a black or brown thing, it's poor white people. And, po and poverty brings tribalism and gang violence. It doesn't matter where you're at, what city, what race, what culture. So. Um, you know, we were dealing with the crack cocaine epidemic. People were losing a lot of their jobs, especially from a lot of those warehouses, which are north of Park Hill. Um, you know, we had an influx of, you know, the Crips started rising just west of Carl Boulevard. And I had this sense like I had to fight and be in the community because there started being gang fights, gang homicides, things of this nature. Crips coming into Park Hill doing homicides, bloods going into the Five Points area doing homicides. And it got to the point to where everybody started kind of being more tight knit. It, it, it becoming from Park Hill or from the Five Points became more of a really like, where are you from? You know, not just like there's no gang war. We're from over here, but we love each other. Now it was kind of like, where are you from? Like if you're not from over here, so I felt like I had to defend the hood, the community. I would say, you know, we call it the hood, but the community in that sense. But as I started getting older, I started seeing people like. Che Guevara, Martin Luther King, Jesus Christ, Malcolm X, just all of these different revolutionary figures. And I just fell in love with the revolutionary struggle, just these type of people who doesn't want to be like Malcolm X, right? Who doesn't, even if you're white, even if you're a lady, like who doesn't want to be like Mother Teresa, right? Like that humble and helping people who doesn't want to be like Martin Luther King. And so I just started reading their autobiographies, reading the Bible. I, I read parts of the Quran, just all these different things. and. It was just one day I was like, I want to represent Park Hill like this. Like, this is the way I want to represent my community and my own self. And it was just literally one day I was just like, I'm done. I don't want to do it anymore. So, Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. So, Julian, let's talk about what was Terrence like when you, when you met him? You had read about this. You had this article in your head when you 
coming back and forth between New York and Denver now. When you guys met, what was that like? Let's talk about that first meeting and then kind of continue on from there. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so it was uh, February 2014. Um, Terrence was out on bond at this point, um, facing a long prison term and um, for the shooting. The, the, the guy he shot, Hassan Jones, was a blood gang member who he had been working with, trying to get out of the gang. I, I, basically what I knew only was what had been in the media, um, which was a lot. Um, and I, so I was sort of, you know, didn't know exactly what to expect. I mean, one thing I did sense, I mean, it was like, uh, basically I guess what I sensed in general, everything was just this sense of history coming out of him, but like it, just so much history that it was like even more than just his own history. It was like going back generations. <laughs> it felt like, it just felt like he was so symbolic of so much. Um, and that I could also certainly, in other words, for that matter, you know, sense his past. And that included, of course, he's got tattoos. He's got um, things that look like gang, to, ca gang tattoos. Um, but he didn't, you know, feel or come across like a gang member. He was, I mean, and, and all of you who know him, I mean, he's incredibly energetic, has a huge, uh, you know, personality and spirit, um, can, you know, wax on and on about many, many topics from, you know, gang history to hip hop history to black history. Uh, so he's a very uh, interesting person to talk to. And then when we got, you know, into the questions about what happened, I mean, that's where it sort of took a turn that I just didn't know how to ex explain or understand at first, um, which was things along the lines of that he felt that he had been um, potentially attacked on the day in question. Well, he felt he had been attacked. He felt that he had, it had maybe been part of a strategic attack uh, to remove him from his position. Uh, he had he'd been working out of an office, a community office, doing anti-gang work uh, right at Holly Square, which for years and years had been the headquarters of Denver's first Bloods gang. Um, and then there he was, you know, doing anti-gang work there. So was it just that they wanted him out? Did other people want him out? He had seeming beefs with almost all of the powers that be at the Holly, which were many, and they were all very powerful people and organizations, none of whom had really ties to the place other than that they had kind of uh, bought their way into it after a fire had burned the Holly down in 20, 2008 had burned the shopping center there down. So I basically could tell that he was sort of, a, it was almost like he was you know, an enemy in his own country kind of person, and, but he, now he was on the run. And he was telling me he was on the run. He was telling me he was you know, potentially feared for his life. So it was just, a, it, it was a really, he felt like someone in a state of extremis. And um, it, I wanted to try to start to understand what was going on. And Terrence, what, what did you think of Julian? When you guys first met, here's someone coming in, uh, approaching you about telling your story, or telling a story, not only about the neighborhood that you love, mm -hmm. but about your life. What were your impressions of him? Uh, so when I got his email, because I was getting a ton of emails from all kind of journalists and different people, and I was just ignoring them, deleting them. And then I seen his name, I don't even know, we'll maybe click on it, Julian Rubenstein, right? It's like something about his name, it's like, uh, let me just see what's going on with this guy, right? So I was like, so I seen it, he was like, hey, I seen your story in New York Times, I'm in New York, you know, I live from, I'm from Denver, I went to Cherry Creek High School. So he like explained himself, but I, I Googled him, I looked him up, like, who is this guy? And I seen he wrote Ballad of the Whiskey Robber. So to be honest, initially I was like, man, hopefully, you know, if he could listen to just what I feel happened to me because the local media, they were just throwing me under the bus, like letting these gang members say all these things about me. Like I was in the gang still and like I was, had this bad attitude and I didn't, I just cared about the community. I was building playgrounds. I, I was building plastic basketball courts, right? So, um, and he came to Denver and I liked Julian. I liked him, he's, he's serious, he's professional. Um, even with me, he got to the bottom of things and that's what I needed. I'm not ashamed. I didn't have anything to hide from Julian, so I'm like, yeah, get to the bottom of it. You know, so um, I'm happy he did the story. If it wasn't someone with his professionalism, 
and with his tenacity to get to the bottom of things and his, his journalistic integrity, I don't think we wouldn't be sitting here tonight. It would, be totally, it would be a totally different story. So one of the things we're going to talk about as we're coming up, you've always felt like you were targeted. So I want to play now, not me, but we want to play a clip now, a one-minute clip from an upcoming documentary about uh, the Holly. And just for the viewers on the stream, I guess, we'll have to show only the link for some copyright reasons. It's only 59 seconds, so stick with us. We're coming right back to you. Anyone watching on the stream will be right back. Okay, here we go. The number of murders in the city. Thank you. Now, I failed to mention at the, at the top of this that for the folks that are streaming, uh, we have someone that's awaiting questions from you. Just, so just type them in to whatever you use in Facebook or, or uh, YouTube and type them in and we'll, we'll try to get to them, okay? So that's for the folks that are streaming. Thank you. So Terrence, why do you feel you were targeted? I feel like initially law enforcement who I feel in this city have an unhealthy relationship with elected officials, with journalists, which is a different, bigger conversation. I feel initially when law enforcement didn't view me as someone who was going to be protesting police brutality, um, police misconduct, I, I was winning every award you could think of, national awards. I was always on television, I was always in the press. Um, Patty's here, I will say the only media outlet I think locally that kind of told a fair story, tried to stick by me, was Westward. Um, you know, so <clears throat> thank you to Patty, thank you to Westward. We all know Westward has definitely helped push this city in a progressive way. But, um, and you know, it, it, the pressure really started around the time when um, Trayvon Martin was killed. Uh, then uh, when Mike Brown was killed and we, when we started doing marches and demonstrations and we had did a huge march, I had put on my Facebook page to tell people to meet me at the Martin Luther King statue, which is north of east. We ended up having other activists put out a flyer. We just had a, a huge rally. Denver hadn't had those type of marches since the 60s, early 70s. And um, there was a picture of me in the Denver Post or the Rocky Mountain News, one of those papers, I can't remember. And they had me like on my bullhorn and it said like, Denver police are the biggest gangs in the city and it was like the sign and the next day literally I had two patrol cars parked in my office um, and since that day they literally it feels like me and law enforcement have not been able to come to an understanding about how to treat one another in the community so do you want to there's a bigger answer to that but I'll well I mean yeah that. there's exactly we could we could talk about this for a long time I mean it would for me <clears throat> uh, the reason the clip, I mean, and for those of you at home, there's, it's, it's actually on the, the hollybook.com, the, the, the video's there as well. Um, but it's just a little teaser that, that gets into some of what I started encountering when I started reporting the story, which was that a lot of people in the neighborhood did think that Terrence was definitely targeted uh, by law enforcement. They thought it was uh, like, a, like obvious, totally obvious, because they would point out um, that Terrence was the basically the personification of someone who historically had been targeted, and we can't ignore our history. And that's again why I was inclined to draw into the book some of the uh, stories and leaders and what had happened from the uh, civil rights movement, the Black Power figures who had been eliminated, and and then you know it was that vacuum that really created this whole rise of drugs, gangs, poverty, that 
at least in their eyes, fed into the systemic nature of what U.S. law enforcement and the criminal justice system was wanting for black people. And the reality was that as I you know, kept reporting it, it did become very clear that Terrence had been both extremely successful as a true independent street level activist who had put together something called the Cal Colorado Camo Movement and through the sheer dent of his you know, will and personality um, and, and others that got on board and there's some of the others are here tonight. Uh, Alex Landau, Gerald Wright, um, and they were all working to try to provide something better, another al al alternative for these youth who might join gangs. Well, Terrence also ended up by the time of the shooting uh, that he shot this younger gang member at this peace rally, he had actually become at odds with basically all of the powers that be at the Holly, the new powers that be. None of them were from the neighborhood. They included the city who had become an investor in the property, uh, the Urban Land Conservancy, which had bought the property, the Boys and Girls Club, Anschutz Foundation, which had, which had become the largest investor and put $5 million into the club, the Denver Foundation, which is a quasi-governmental -gover agency, basically, in, in Denver. And none of them were operating in a way that Terrence thought was really in the interests of the community. And he had started to uh, say that. And he'd resigned, in fact, from his position uh, on the Holly Area Redevelopment Project. And he also had, even though he didn't want to, one of the problems right now with anti-gang work, and it's really important work and really hard to do, but the funding is controlled almost totally, some huge percentage of it is controlled by law enforcement. And so ultimately Terrence took a law enforcement related grant, part of the Project Safe Neighborhoods grant that Denver got, and he ended up at odds with the police as well about how to run the anti-gang program. And sure enough, as the um, months before the uh, Boys and Girls Club opened, all kinds of bloods were suddenly all over the, the Holly where they hadn't been before. And Terrence had, and others, felt that he was being infiltrated by some of these people who they believed were informants. And so all of this was going on and these were the things that I started to report on as hard as I could. I started pulling court documents, police records. I, I interviewed these guys. I you know, went around and talked to as many people as I could, which you know, we've discussed a little bit how it was not easy, of course, being a white person uh, in a black neighborhood trying to interview gang members and potential informants about this kind of thing. Um, but I basically just kept showing up, kept just trying to listen, trying to hear what was going on. And I did definitely start to see where, who was, for example, I mean, among the many things you use as a journalist to try to get your bearings and get, your, get a handle on like who you can trust, who's who, you start to hear how people speak to you and what they say and if they're truthful to you, which you can obviously you often check out in other ways. And as it went on, I was able to develop enough sources who did tell me, including a firsthand source, about that there was a planned attack on Terrence this particular day. And I did also find out that the people involved in it had very close ties to the police. Um, proving someone's an informant is a difficult thing because there's not a lot of paperwork or any paperwork associated with it. It's often looking at their criminal case record and whether or not they're actually being charged or um, if charges are being dropped, just how they're being treated. Um, I also witnessed uh, things including these people interacting with law enforcement and I did get some other paperwork work that proved that some of these people at various times were working for the police. So it started to paint a picture of something that at first seemed far-fetched and the deeper and deeper I got didn't seem far-fetched at all. Um, and so, you know, what I've seen not only in Denver but elsewhere throughout history, but even in Denver, of course, is that uh, activists in this city <laughs> going right up to this year, and by the way, the book ends, uh, the, uh, 
one story I've said a few times, thank God, a lot of writers miss their book deadline. I missed mine by two or three years. <laughs> and in this case, thank God I did, because had I not been able to include the incredible events of even 2019, following Elijah McClain's death, which Terrence became very involved in that movement, justice for Elijah McClain, and then George Floyd's murder, and then uh, the book, basically the epilogue of the book is its own <laughs> mini, you know, Shakespearean tragedy of some sort, um, and seems to sort of underline so many of the questions and findings in the book. Uh, but the book, I didn't stop reporting it until February of 2021. I started reporting in February 2014. So sure enough, in February 2021, Terrence was charged with felony charges of inciting a riot for leading peaceful protests. And you know, over and over, I've seen it now with my own eyes, and I've seen it with my research, that activists in this city and elsewhere are targeted. And, uh, you know, I guess, you know, I have to read the book to find out exactly what I could prove and what I could, couldn't prove. But there was, as you saw in the video, I guess one question that's at the heart of the book becomes whether or not Terrence was attacked by police informants and whether he was targeted and whether in fact he was targeted to be removed from his position in Holly Square over political reasons. The guy who was the third generation resident of the community so that other interests, white interests, rich interests, wealthy and powerful people who had no previous connection to the community could take it over. And so that's something of course that is not only considered in the book and I think the history of informants as well as the development of Denver are things that go on throughout the course of the book. And I think this will be proven too as you read the book and also as we live our lives that that economic, you know, rule everything. And that's why I think he was targeted for one thing. Tell let's talk about uh, you now, what, what's going on. You, you alluded to the fact that he had been uh, uh, charged with seven um, different charges in Arapahoe and Adams County uh, recently for the Elijah McClain protests, and I think some of his um, uh, individuals that were charged with him are probably in the audience here tonight, too. Yep. So, well, a lot of PSL Denver yeah. in the back. Yeah. So. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Lillian, Eliza, yeah. Joel Thank you are so back there. For Thanks for here. coming. Yeah. Ryan. Yeah. Ryan, yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Thank you for giving me some of your time recently to uh, sit down in conversation with me as well, too. So, um, Tim, let's talk about you now, 2021. What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> well, know what just happened? Tell me. You, you have so, news just a few days ago. We have great news. So, Yeah, so um, Arap Adams County dismissed our felony charges and our misdemeanor charges in Adams County. <laughs> but, there is a but. <laughs> Arapahoe County needs to step up and dismiss the rest of our misdemeanor charges. Yes, yes. Um, I still have one misdemeanor charge pending. Joel has like seven. Lillian had 50 charges, so she probably has 30 still pending. I don't know how many. She had like 25 felonies or something, but um, yeah. I, I work for Zillow. Um, I may be the only African-American scope evaluator, renovation scope evaluation for, for Zillow when they're tuning in, so one love to Zillow. Thank you for the support. They hired me, they took a chance on me. Mm -hmm. um, it's worked out, it's helped me get on my feet. So um, it's a great company. Uh, just organizing, I had to really take a step back from organizing because they had me charged with felony rioting and I didn't want to you know, get my bond revoked or you know, poke the bear too much. I still have a career, I have children. Like I also have to take that into consideration while we're fighting you know, for the lives of other kids. I have my own kids as well. So um, we kind of slowed down a little bit on like the protesting, it got cold, COVID, but we're out organizing. We're about to start working on legislation for laws and handles around the use of dangerous informants. That I am a victim of the local and federal police using murderers on paper, rapists, animal abusers, child abusers, any abuse you can name, these men and some of women were a part of, and they, they did attack me, you know, so um, that's what we're working on. We're going to work on what we can do to do better policing, and that is going to be a huge part 
of police reform. Uh, we worked on Senate, um, Senate Bill 217. We wrote portions of that in my living room. Um, we delivered it to James Coleman and to Leslie Harrod. They got it signed into law last Juneteenth. Um, thank you to Jared Polis for signing Senate Bill 217 into law. So, um, we, um, Aurora passed a uh, no knock um, raid ban, so that's gonna save some lives. It can't just boot you during and murder you like they did Breonna Taylor in Kentucky, so that's something that um, came from our work, from our protesting, and there is a investigation going on for the officers right now, a grand jury investigation for the officers who murdered Elijah McClain, so we're still not done, we're not finished. We still need justice for Elijah McClain, so we're still working on those same issues until we get justice for this young man who was murdered by the police. We're going to keep doing whatever we have to do. It may be a protest. We may write a law. We may, we, we may TP something. I don't know what we're gonna do, but <laughs> whatever needs to happen, that's what we're going to do, right? So um, at work, I'm really busy with Zillow. Um, you know, the iBuyer industry, which is kind of now what Zillow's into, is growing. Um, so I stay busy organizing and just working and being with my kids, being with my, my few friends that I have, and just trying to live my life, getting to this next phase of my life. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you for sharing that, and thank you like, for the hard work that you and your friends are still doing, especially for Eliza McClain, which is, which is in my hood, and which is very near and dear to my heart, and working on that, uh, you know, from a, from a filmmaker perspective, that's what I'm doing. So um, you talked about, in the book, and alluded to a little bit tonight, the use of informants and activists being targeted. Can you talk a little bit more about that, uh, Julian? You know, and, 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 and you alluded to a fact that here you are going into a neighborhood and talking to Terrence, you had Terrence, but I also want to acknowledge before we go into father uh, that Terrence, your father is here, George Roberts. I want to make sure that we acknowledge him, um, the Reverend George Roberts. <laughs> who does very hard work himself too. And, and he's a big character in the book. For, for those of you who have read it, you know, and he's one of my favorite characters in the book. And George, as he knows, he got me through a lot too. He's an amazing person and, you know, the guy who's done more gang funerals than anyone in Denver. And as I always said, he was the, always the person who had a smile, had something to cheer someone up when everyone and all he deals with is hardship and, and all that. So it's, it's remarkable. He's an amazing person. And he's, he's in the healing business. You know, that's yep. what I say. He's in the healing business. Try to heal these families that have been torn apart by uh, gang violence or police uh, brutality. So if, I, if I have any swag, I got it from Mr. George Robertson. <laughs> yeah. Father, so. yeah. He the told little me, bit I have, I got, I got He told me earlier <laughs> that you got it from me. <laughs> <laughs> so, but let's talk a little bit about this, because that, like you said, some things you prove and some things you alluded to maybe cannot prove, but this has been a real issue throughout all the movements that have gone throughout our history, even starting with enslaved Africans uh, and getting people to talk and inform on other people. You know, so that's, let's tell Master what was going on. Then going from the 20s and 30s, let's tell people what's going on, who's going to get on the bus, who's not going to get on the bus. Let's go to the human rights movements of the 60s, the so-called Southern Freedom Movement. Let's, let's inform on them, you know, the people infiltrated, and people infiltrated the Panthers. You know, all these different movements have been infiltrated by informants. And always money was at the center of it. And you talk about this in your book. Can you talk about it just a little bit in the time we have left here? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of uh, fascinating things about informants. I mean, they're the black hole of the criminal justice system. These are people who are paid in cash. There's almost no paperwork. In Denver, there's a safe in the police headquarters where the names are, and then they, they you know, they go by a handle that they can choose. Um, they. If you think about an analogy being like Blackwater in Iraq or, you know, military contractors, I mean, this is a totally unregulated industry. And so we don't know what they're doing. I mean, there are things in the book there that I'm able to find out. And there are other things that remain in a gray area that are like seem like you think you know where they're going, but it's hard to say exactly. One of the reasons, and I don't know if, um, Tyrone's here. Is Tyrone here? I didn't see him. So, well, anyway, uh, you're here? Tyrone. Okay. All right. There's Tyrone Glover. 
president of the Denver Bar Association and Terrence's lawyer. Um, He's the best and, lawyer in the world, just like you guys know. <laughs> so, um, and we, and you know, Terrence and I have talked to Tyrone um, and another lawyer about the possibility of trying to push some legislators who are interested in 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 reforming or not even reforming in, in making laws that oversee the use of informants. Most people have maybe one sort of touchstone about informants and that's Whitey Bulger, the Irish crime boss in Boston, who in the 1990s was revealed to be an FBI informant for at least 20 years, during which time he committed something like two dozen murders. And at the time it was called one of the greatest scandals or if not the greatest scandal in law enforcement history. Nothing happened. And here we are today where in our most vulnerable communities in America, we see the use, the use and misuse of informants as a, just a regular part of what's going on. And that was absolutely the case in this story, in, in the Holly. And it, it was a neighborhood, and frankly, one of the most interesting things for me personally to kind of discover at the end of um, the process was that perhaps as a white person, several African Americans told me, Maybe it was actually an advantage to me because the mistrust, sadly, among black men in a lot of black communities is so high because you don't necessarily know, is that, can I trust my friend? Is he who he says he is? Is the guy at the store who he says he is? Why is he ask, asking me this question? I mean, this is stuff that comes to real life in this book uh, with the stuff that Terrence had to deal with. So um, without a doubt, there are multiple cases of the misuse of informants and mis misconduct by police regarding the use of informants that are documented in the book. And in terms of one thing that's going on now for, for me, and which is kind of exciting, and I, most people here know, is that just in the last couple days, you know, the book is out today, um, but in the last couple days there's been a, quite a storm of media, some of whom have been running with some of the findings that I've uh, come up with and asking some of the lawmakers and elected officials here in town, well, what about this, what about this? And, you know, we have a high-ranking member of the Bloods currently who appears to be working for the city still, by the way. I mean, he was been working for them for a long time. Um, and meanwhile, committing crimes, having the charges dropped or no charges. This is not a guy who's, uh, this is a guy who people are afraid of, and he's being trotted out as an anti-gang activist. Why? Why does law enforcement want these people? What do they want over them? What are they using them for? Terrence's case is one of those kind of cases that has to be held forward. Anyone thinking about, you know, who cared about what happened with the takedown of people like Fred Hampton? What about these black power leaders? What about activists who are being targeted? You look at his case and you have to really say, this needs to be scrutinized, and I think I, I do it in the book. And hopefully that is going to lead to some kind of reform. I mean, it's you know a ways to go. Incredibly, there's not even one state in the country that has any laws regarding informants, nor a federal law. There are only guidelines, which are violated all the time because there's no consequences. So that is one thing that may be a sort of a action item that comes out of some of this reporting. and. I would certainly uh, be supportive of it. Can I say something real quick, Donnie? Of course. Go? Well, you asked me earlier about why was I targeted. Yes. And there was a piece I didn't really get to add. So, like, one love to my friend Gerald Wright. Gerald's here. Um, my father, George Roberts, give clap Gerald up. My father was a part of it. You know, um, so a lot of people don't understand this, but in Park Hill, starting from Ash, Albion, all of these different streets are named after Grape Street, Bel Air. These are plants, okay? So the official colors of Park Hill have always been green, red, yellow, and these are the colors of African American liberation too, just African liberation in general. Many different cultures use these same colors for liberation. So we were wearing, we were wearing green and gold um, just to symbolize part of prodigal son, just for the community. Uh, but then I took a trip to Haiti. I did a humanitarian, a humanitarian trip to Port-au-Prince, and the activists there were wearing camouflage. So I came back to my after-school program, and I, Gerald's kids were actually in the program. My son was in the program at the time. Now he's 26, but they, they, you know, these kids were 11, 12. 
And uh, I explained to them what I seen in Haiti with these activists and the kids were actually like, well, let's get some camouflage shirts. So I bought a, some camouflage shirts and we got these gold emblems with prodigal son and our emblem was the hand of God holding up the city of Denver and at the skyline and everybody wanted it. Juro was taking it to the five points. He's an ex-crip. He was giving them the crips. I was in the middle of the holly. Bloods were, it, it was just going like hotcakes. And we didn't charge anybody. I had a grant to buy the shirt. So we were just giving them out. They're like $5 a piece. And one day I came to the holly. Half of the bloods were wearing camouflage. And the other half were mad at the other half. You know what I mean? So <laughs> then, you know, Jero, you know, had got some crib members to say, you know what, man, if those brothers are willing to do it, you know, bloods weren't going to wear blue bandanas. Crips were not going to wear red bandanas. But they all like camouflage. So it was like, man, if we could take some $5 t-shirts and get Crips and Bloods together, pff, I'm down with that. Like, I'll pay for that out of my own pocket. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. So um, we started having barbecues. We started going to nightclubs together. We just, uh, I was hanging out with Gerald going to his birthday parties. It, it'd be brothers he grew up with who were Crips, and they were honoring me and showing me love. Gerald would be in my office. It'd be 50 Bloods in the Holly, and Gerald and other Crips would be there. Um, and so in 2010, we had 10 gang-related homicides. Just last year, 2020 alone, we had 95 homicides in the city of Denver. And everyone in this room knows that the majority of homicides in Denver are youth or gang-related homicides. That we're not having that many domestic violence homicides in Denver. This is not New Orleans, it's that many drug-related homicides over kilos of dope. Most of our homicides in Denver are youth-related teenage homicides about gang violence. You know, so we went from 10 just a few years ago to around 85 gang-related homicides last year. And um, that's kind of why they wanted us out. Not just me. I wasn't the only person attacked. Uh, Gerald was attacked. My father was attacked. Everyone who supported me in that movement to reduce violence, uh, we were literally putting police out of business. There's no reason to write a federal grant for $3 million if we only have 10 gang-related homicides. Right. Now you need a federal grant because there's almost 100 yeah. homicides. Yeah. So and that was part of the reason why I was targeted because we were lowering violence and we weren't taking cues like Julian said. Um, we weren't doing word on the street meetings with parole and probation. We didn't need to work with law enforcement. We weren't even against the law enforcement. We were just like, we got this already. We know the Bloods and Crips. We don't need adult parole to come tell me how to talk to my friend who I grew up with. Like, you know, so uh, we started bumping heads and um, that's kind of, I want to finish answering that question to give more context around what happened. Thank you for that. But just with one com yeah, comment. We'll yeah. See if we can get some questions. Okay. Dave, did you have anybody who have any questions? Uh, anybody in the audience wanted to ask a question before we come back to Julian? And um, so just if you do, just come a little closer so I can hear you. Okay. Go ahead, Julian. I was just going to say that, uh, you know, for, so it was uh, gang violence in Denver in 2010 when the camo movement was really peaking and going strong was an all-time low. That year, this Project Safe Neighborhoods grant came in, and between 2010 and 2019, I counted $16 million in federal funding, both uh, DOJ and CDC money that also came in to study gang violence, so to study and to fight gang violence, $16 million over nine uh, years, and gang violence went up every single year, up, 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 up. In history, in the gang communities, there is an obvious um, uh, you know, path of former gang members trying to do an independent peace effort that is pushed back or put down or met with you know, serious pushback from law enforcement who doesn't seem to like it. They want to run the thing, but then they take it over, get a lot of money for it, and the result is a heavily increase in violence. So, I mean, you know, it does beg the question, what we're dealing with here in gang communities, people talk about the war industrial complex, the criminal industrial complex. Are we looking at an urban war industrial complex? there is evidence that would suggest so. Yeah, we we'll definitely have that. Thank you. Um, were there any questions? We've got a very quiet audience here. Everybody in this room okay. has been probably listening to me and Julian talk about this. For seven <laughs> oh, years I know it. That. I know it. I know it. But there's still like we know everything about know. Yes. Jimmy? 
Oh, no? Okay. okay. So I'll okay, just... Trig. Trig's got one. Yes. <laughs> Great <Good> suggestion. <laughs> Thank you. So we are so okay. We good. We have a question back there. Yeah. Okay. No, great. Thank you, Ed. Look, seeing Ed Cope, principal of in, of a school inside a youth detention uh, facility, uh, where I uh, he helped me um, get together with a, a mentee that I had. There's a program that runs in there. Mentorship uh, is obviously or maybe not obviously, but is one of the most important things in youth's lives. It was one thing I saw that Terrence, Gerald, and Alex, and all the people working in that area understood and knew that they had to provide a positive role model for so many of these youth that just simply didn't have one. Um, and so I did end up, and I should say it gives me a chance to, to give a nod to a few of the people who the book is dedicated to. Uh, one is my mom, who I guess is watching on the streaming. And just thinking about streaming, by the way, if my great editor, Alex Starr, is watching, hello, as well as my agent, Zoe. Hey, guys, in New York. I hope you're there. And, um, but I, you know, I thought it, it, the other people who, the other main person who's dedicated in the book is uh, my mentee, Norm Mon Monday. He had... He was a refugee from Ethiopia, came over with his family, ended up in the youth correctional system. Sure enough, you know, it escaped factional fighting in Africa only to fall right in with a street gang in Denver. Um, and unfortunately, as Ed knows, as a guy we both knew, I worked with him for three years and he was killed in a shootout in 2019 at the age of 19. Um, so these are the realities that kids on the feeder street are facing. Um, and it's hard, and, and it's, it's particularly hard for me to see when the, you know, there are resources that people want to devote to these kinds of things, um, and then when there are a lot of resources that are de devoted in this official way or through law enforcement, the, even the social services part is often being controlled by law enforcement money and isn't necessarily as effective as it might be able to be through some of the really powerful independent efforts. Skip Townsend, who was on the video that you saw here in the room, who talked about that Terrence Roberts, by the way, his line right before that, he said, we saw it with Fred Hampton, we saw it with Medgar Evers, and now we're seeing it with Terrence Roberts, that the passionate, he, he's the new example of how the system will shut down the passionate movement for peace. And why is that? So, you know, that's one thing that I've been thinking about a lot and that there are some new efforts that, of course, are trying to compete in some way and create a new model that doesn't always have to be funded by law enforcement, which might, in fact, have different goals. So, and yes, just to answer briefly, though, Trick's question, I think we briefly touched on it, though, but just so all of you know, since, you know, we're here ce celebrating the release of the book, but I go back to work tomorrow morning and we're in the edit, we're editing this documentary film in which I was able to capture some extraordinary events that also are in the book. And the third act of the book is when I join this story and it leads from me coming to the story all the way up to t first to Terrence's going to trial, facing life in prison, by which time the reader will have learned quite a lot about what happened and how the city of Denver is running their anti-gang program. And we captured almost all of that on film, and, um, and we, including the trial. Uh, and then there's the aftermath of the events of 2019 to 2021. So um, in any case, yep, we're making a film on it and um, look forward to hopefully showing you guys that sometime later this year as well. Thank you. So the book is called The Holly, Five Bullets, One Gun, and the Struggle to Save an American Neighborhood by Julian Rubenstein. It's getting a lot of buzz already, a lot of praise. In the start pre-publication review, book list called the book a shattering piece of investigative journalism involving street gangs, race relations, and law enforcement. And another Star Review publisher weekly wrote that this offers a profound insight into the forces that plague American inner cities. And it's been generating news uh, from the different local publications, except the uh, major 
quote unquote major. <laughs> but yeah. like I said, we think Westward, we think all the other publications that reach out and do that, the real work and dig deep. Um, it's been my honor and pleasure to be the moderator tonight for the Holly uh, and talk to these two amazing gentlemen, uh, Julian Rubenstein and Terrence Roberts. Please put your hands together. <laughs> So, Julian wants you to know there are books right here that oh, yeah. he will sign for you that you can take home with you. You can start reading uh, so you can know more about this amazing story. Like I said, you think you know it, but you don't know it. There's so, it's right here on this table there, I here. Question, I guess, over here. Question? Yeah. Oh. A question? You late to the program, by the way. The question was 20, 10 <laughs> minutes ago. Anyway, go ahead. We can squeeze him in. We'll squeeze you in. <laughs> question is how people, uh, you're 12? How people can get involved in helping. See, now I feel on the spot because I don't have prodigal son anymore. <laughs> right, right. To, to facilitate really having someone's 12 year old daughter safely in our programs, because we're protesting, like, you may get sprayed in the face with pepper spray, but uh, it's not always about protesting. That's why we're trying to transition like FPRA, which is our organization, Frontline Party for Revolutionary Action. One we'll love to the FPRA members that are here too. They were protesting with us with PSL, but we want to do things like work on legislation, work on laws. 12-year-olds can help us write laws. There's no format on how you have to present legislation to lawmakers. They can get the gist of it and then they can work with us to implement laws around these types of things. So, you can talk to us because these are committees. We also want to start studying the city budget. Where are we wasting so much money? That's something you could probably talk to Jamie Gillis about because these are things that she understands. So, um, you know, it, it, we do a lot of protesting, but just protesting alone is not going to get us to the goals. We're writing legislation. We're, we're protesting. We're doing barbecues. We're comrades just coming. Let's just break bread. Let's hang out, drink a beer. Like, it's, everything doesn't have to be angry all the time, right? We're trying to get us to a happy place. So if you're interested in that, definitely we could talk about legislation. Um, I want to start doing more interim use development, building basketball courts, building playgrounds, rehabbing old buildings in, in, in dilapidated areas so youth can use these spaces, not just have them be drug centers. And why can't we just slap some paint on a building and clean it out? And we could do a football field as a carpet. It's AstroTurf. We could just unroll it just like this. It just, yeah. <laughs> Just unroll it, yeah. and it's a football field, right? So we're taking those steps now because now I'm getting back to where I can do those things because I was derailed um, very badly, but now I'm back. So let's talk about it. We'll get your number. Yeah, and then young people like yourself, you can also teach others your age and, and a little bit older about financial literacy. Those kind of things are so important because if we're talking about up here how the police are getting this money they use for this quote-unquote gang uh, uh, initiative, but uh, what they're doing is taking that money and putting it in their pocket and making military vehicles that they use and weapons that they use, but teaching um, young people how to become more financially literate, especially when people are of color, um, and, and using ge making generational wealth, that sort of thing. I think that's really important too, so that can leave you away from a gang life or a life of drugs because drugs are about economics, right? Yeah. It's making money. So how can you turn that now that intelligence that you use to turn that on the street corner now, because that's all Kennedy's did, that's all anybody else did to have generational wealth. So how can you now use that as a, as a, as a launching pad for young people to use that too? So programs that you're talking about, there's programs in Aurora where I live that do that, especially when you were talking about refugees, you're talking about a young man who was gunned down at 19. I have a friend who runs a program and he has all these pictures up on the wall and I said, can you tell me about these pictures? He said, there was 27 pictures up there, all 27 of them from Ethiopia, or Eritrea, or whatever, they all had been shot. Shot and killed either by the police or by each other. So that's what we're talking about. But if they had a place to make money, they wouldn't have to be on the streets and do that. So young person yeah. like yourself, that's what you can do too. Policy is so important. 
the changing of policy and writing policy. As you can see, there's a sweeping movement around the country now to any laws that are now, that are being positive, the George Floyd law, you know, now Senate Bill 217, they're trying to nip all that stuff and, and, and overturn it. So, but we have to be smart and not let that happen. So, thank you so much for coming up and asking the question. Let me, what's your name, ma'am? Um, are you interested in like interim development or helping legislation? Yes. Okay, well, cool. Should talk, talk to Terrence afterwards. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for the question. As my mentor says, you need to love the question. As Alice Walker says, love the question. Any more before we wrap up? I got a question, Doc. Yes. So with this super epidemic of like murders this past year, um, and you know, there's a lot of banging online, a lot of people using social media memes to, um, you know, fuel violence that's real. Like, how can the <coughs> virtual space be utilized to pull some of that stuff back? Thank you for the question, Dave. Is how can we use uh, social media in a more positive way? Um, I mean, flooding it with positive material and content. You're not gonna stop some gang kids from calling each other bitches and hoes on Facebook. Like, this, this is gonna happen, okay? Like, adults do it. The elected officials do it, right? Like, so some people wake up to get on Facebook. They just, as soon as they get up, they're just like, I'm arguing, I don't agree with it. Like, you know, so we can't stop that, right? Like, so I'm gonna be honest about there's things that we can't stop, but there's things we can do to counteract. Like, okay, they're talking about that, but we got a whole different community. We got a whole different thing going on over here. We're talking about this, that, and that's what we were doing with like the Prodigal Sun Initiative, the camo movement. We couldn't stop someone from being a crip or a blood. I, I'm not Debo, I'm not about to, I can't punch it out of you, right? Like. I'm not a cop, I can't put you in a dungeon and, and hope you reform. All we were doing is saying, hey, if you want to be a blood or a crit, or you want to get on social media and argue with a shooter and he come shoot your head off, I, I can't stop that, but if you want to go to Waterworld, do you want to plant some trees? Hey, you want to stop arguing? You want to go get some coffee? You done arguing? Okay, well, we're about to go over here. And that's how we fight that kind of stuff is like, we can't stop it from happening, but we just have something better. That's it. Just provide a different community to go to, and people have to make their own decision to, to come to that, right? But if they do make that decision, they're not just walking around like, where do we go from here? It's like, we have somewhere to go when you want to do that, and that's the best way to fight social media violence, actual violence, and just having somewhere better for people to go. Thank you. Again, the book is The Holly. Five Bullets, One Gun, and the Struggle to Save an American Neighborhood. Right here, you can get your signed copy from Julian. Now, once again, thank Julian Rubenstein, Terrence Roberts, Dazzle, and uh, the Tattered Covered Bookstore. I'm Donnie Betts. Thank you so much for everybody online. Give us a hand so they can get bread and jam.